Hello, Spark fans, and welcome back to Advancing Spark, where today we're having another Photon Day. So, we've talked about Photon a little bit in the past. This is the C++-based vectorized execution engine that sounds all super fancy, but actually we've been looking at it and playing around with it in the context of that thing called Databricks SQL. So, if you haven't been on the preview, you've not had a chance to have a play around with the Redash-based dashboarding engine that's going to be rolled out as part of Databricks, then you won't have a clue what any of this is about. And that's the news today. So this week, last week, sometime around now, um, the Photon Engine has been rolled out to normal clusters, interactive clusters, job clusters, all of the data science and data engineering workloads. Now, don't get me wrong, there's a huge load of limitations we need to be aware of with it, but you can actually now use Photon for ETL, for data analysis, for running data science, kind of? And there's a load of things that we'll have to take a look at. So that's what we're doing today. We're taking a look at what the Photon experience looks like in the standard data engineering and data science workspace within Databricks, how you get started with it, where you should be using it, the things to look out for, and yeah, how much it costs. Because it does have an additional cost impact, and that's now a decision on your side. You flick that switch and turn it on, in which case it'll make things go faster, so you can have smaller clusters, but if you're not using the kind of things that it makes go faster, you're just going to pay more and you're not going to get a benefit. So be very aware Photon is this awesome execution engine that will make certain things go faster. If you are new around here, as always, do not forget to like and subscribe. Let me know down in the comments if you're using Photon yet. If you've had a play, has it sped up certain activities? Did you get the kind of reduction in VMs that you're actually expecting to inside your clusters? It'd be super interesting to see. But until then, let's go and have a look at what we've got. So starting here, we've got the Photon release notes, right? So talking about it is now in public preview. So 13th of August. Oh, it's last week. So late making this video. Terrible. Uh, so we can now see this, a little bit of details in the docs about what Photon is, how it works, what it's for. And that's the main thing is we used to only be able to see it for Databricks SQL endpoints. And now we can see it for Databricks clusters. So Let's kind of have a quick look about how we actually see it working. So over here, I do have a photon cluster. Um, and I've actually warmed up two clusters because we're going to do a little race. I've got two clusters, one using photon, one not using photon. I want to kick them off doing the same thing at the same time and say which is faster. We'll see how it goes. Um, but let's talk about quickly making a new cluster, right? So I'm going to create a cluster. Get my normal cluster creation. This is going to be my... Photon Mark II. Where's the board? We've got a photon. Uh, cluster mode doesn't actually matter. So I've had a quick play. It works on high concurrency. It works on stand, uh, standard. I've not tried with a single node, but that wouldn't really make sense for Photon of, or Spark. So let's go with standard. And then when we're picking our runtime version, like which runtime should it be? You may notice this fancy little button that we've now got saying enable photon mode. So you know you're using photon if you've hit that little tick box. And you see right away that list of available runtimes just goes right down. So they've only enabled Photon for a certain limited subset of Databricks runtimes, none of which are ML. So be very aware of that. There isn't currently a Photon for ML released. So if you're normally doing lots of data science and you're using the ML based runtimes that come preloaded with a whole ton of ML based libraries, you cannot use Photon currently. That kind of hints going kind of just for data engineering and data analysis at the moment. So it's what it is. We can go and say, I want to use Photon. I want to use Runtime 9. And then we see it's not compatible with the selected driver and worker. So essentially, the worker types that we've got is where we'd normally have when we're not, uh, not using Photon. So we're not picking on one. We get a huge big list of all the different standard Azure VM types. And that all goes away if I pick Photon. So I can go, I want to use Photon. I want to use 9. What do I get? I get the choice of two. I can either use the E series or the L series. Now, a little bit of background for that. If you Google around, you can find this page, which is the Azure Virtual Machine series. Uh, again, there's a similar one for um, AWS and GCP if you're on those ones instead. But what you can see is between the difference, we've got E series, which is really, really optimized for memory. So that has got like much faster RAM in there. It's got generally has a better balance of RAM. Uh, and that is just, I want to do lots of stuff in memory at once. The alternative is L series. And the L series have essentially got better, fastest local storage disks. 
And that's a bit of a balance between the kind of things that you're doing. So actually the machine sizes that we get offered. So if we have a look at what we've got, we've got the standard E8, which is 64 gig of memory and eight cores, or the L8, which is 64 gig of memory and eight cores. Kind of the same. It's just, do you want slightly faster type of RAM in there so we can do your memory stuff faster? Or do you want faster local disks so it can do more Delta caching? Delta cache is kind of where we see it coming in. So they're both Delta cache enabled. They've both got SSDs. It's just how fast is that SSD? How much space do you get in that SSD? It's different depending on whether you pick an E series or an L series. So we stick with L series. That's going to have a local, real fast, optimized uh, local disk. That is the, I always figure the thing. It's the NVMe type storage which just means that when we're doing things we're repeatedly going back and forwards from a delta table, what the delta cache will do is just each time it gets a segment of data from that particular delta table, it'll just keep it on local cache until it needs something else and get rid of it. But that means if you're going back to a table several times without you having to deliberately in your code say data frame dot cache and force it into memory or decide the level of persistence you want, delta cache is going to automatically cache things to speed things up as you go back to it. So L series or E series, they've both got the Delta cache. It's just, do you want to optimize slightly more towards memory or slightly more towards um, that cache storage? And it's kind of up to you. So that, that is our choice when we're creating our cluster. So the two um, clusters I've made, I've turned auto scaling off. I've just said just two workers, keep it nice and small. Note that the smallest worker we can go for is that eight core uh, 64 gig. Whereas if you're not in Photon, you can have a four core and you can have tiny workers. Kind of up to you. Uh, but it looks like everything else is actually enabled. So I can still, still click spot instance. Don't get a warning. I've not tried these things. You can still say I want to use credential pass through. Still seems all right. I can still actually switch over to your high concurrency and say, you know what? I want to use Photon. And it seems all right. It seems to work and it can, we can actually go ahead and do those things. So actually in terms of cost configuration, we've still got lots of choices, just not as much choice as you would normally get. The other thing to be aware of is this thing down at the bottom. So if we switch auto scaling off and I say I want just one, two workers, you can see that's going to cost me 13.8 DBUs per hour. A DBU is a Databricks licensing unit. Essentially, you're paying for the pure tin. So in Azure, you're paying Microsoft for I'm, I'm getting this VM. And then you're paying Databricks a license to be using Databricks on top of those VMs. So what we've got here is 13.8 is the DBU cost for this setup. So I've got two standard L8s and the same as workers. So I've got three nodes, three VMs, and that's costing me 13.8 DBUs per hour. Now I switch over to, I've got another cluster set up. Uh, here I'm using the same thing. I've got two L8s, I've got uh, an L8 driver, except I'm not using Photon. That's only costing me six DBUs per hour. And that is the Photon message, right? So Photon is more expensive. If I flick that switch, say yes, use this faster, optimized, vectorized execution engine, it's going to charge me more for that license. It's a premium license on top of any other premium cost I'm already paying. So basically, it's like a 60% uplift in the cost for the license. Not the tin. The VMs are still the same price. We're still paying for an L8 machine by the hour or by the minute. But the licensing cost, the DBU cost for that machine is more expensive. So turning Photon on costs more. That is a base message. Now, the whole point being, it's also faster so you can get your job finished faster or you can use fewer VMs, therefore it's cheaper. And so that's the careful balance you have to make. And it's all down to that DBU cost is going up if we're using Photon for our clusters. So but these two things turned on. So I've got my Photon cluster, standard L8, two of them, and that's 13.9. I've got my latest standard cluster that I use for doing lots of stuff. Again, that's still two workers, still L8, still a driver, and it goes from six. 13.8 DBUs and you can check the Azure pricing you can go and have a look at the DBU cost per hour and that's all available for you so message it is more expensive but you can use it wisely okay so going back to that little thing that's how we spin up a photon cluster um other thing to note is that we can also go and we can do it through jobs so if I create a job and I choose the cluster it's going to run on I can run on photon clusters they're available for me to select I can also create a new cluster edit it and I do have Photon available. So whether you're doing standard clusters or whether you're doing job clusters, you can still use Photon if you want to do that. So if you had a job that kicked off regularly, ran a notebook and a load of scripts and you want to run that on a cheaper 
uh, thing because you're using a job cluster, not interactive cluster. You can still use Photon, in which case there's a... It's using the job cluster pricing, but then with the Photon DBU price accelerator. So, yeah, stuff. Flexible. Use it in lots of different ways. Be aware. Okay, so let's dive in over here. I've got a workbook I've made. So I've got two workbooks, both doing the same thing. Let's dive into there. So I've got Photon and Photon 2. Exactly the same notebook. I just made a clone of it. So that we can run one using Photon and one without Photon and have a look at how it actually works. I'm going to run through this. going to quickly show you what we're doing. I'm stealing from uh, Denny and Co's book where they've got that learning spark data set and we've got a giant people data set so i'm running a quick query over there saying what have we got load of parquet inside it we can go and see uh, i'm going to bring that into a data frame to go off read it as a delta table no longer need that from runtime aid because it's going to default to delta but it's always, it's always best to write it uh, and load from that location so i'm bringing in just a real basic data set uh, i'm going to save that as my people table uh, and then I've got some SQL queries. So I made a quick date dimension. I hacked together a date dimension just by taking that same table, actually, uh, and turning it into, I want a date key, a year, month, day, that kind of stuff. Trying to make it a bit like a dimensional model. And then we're running this query. So I'm saying, well, I want to take my year. I want to do a count of how many people had a birthday in each given year in that people data set. So I'm saying, take people. That's that kind of temporary data set I made from that data frame. Uh, join it to my dim, di uh, my dim date, my date dimension style stuff. It's going to do some calculation on the key, which is always awkward. Uh, it's doing some aggregation. Super, super basic example, right? I just wanted to go do a thing, work out some data, because that is what Photon is good at. Photon's good at joins. It's good at aggregations. It's good at that kind of good analysis crunching kind of stuff. And what we'll actually see when we look at this is we can go and have a look at the execution plan and say, what happened inside it? What did you do? What did you do when I hit go? How did it work? What did we actually see inside it? Uh, and if I just open that up, we can go and have a look inside here and say, what, is the, what was that execution plan? What happened in here? So there's an associated SQL query and we get a sea of yellow. And that's how you know it's working in Photon. And I went through this a bit more in detail back in another uh, example when we we're talking about uh, Databricks SQL and the Photon Engine there. But you can see just from this example that it's working on Photon. Anything that is in blue, uh, which is only right at the end, is working in the traditional Spark engine. And that's what Photon does. Photon is like an extra engine it's going to try and use. But occasionally things are might be in your script that aren't supported with Photon. It doesn't know how to do that in the C++ engine. So it's going to revert back to the standard traditional Spark engine. It's going to be doing that inside a JVM, doing normal Sparky stuff. So if you have a query and it's all a sea of yellow, like, great. That is working inside Photon. Whereas if you're in an query and it's largely blue, it's like, well, that's not really using the Photon Engine. That's not going to go any faster. Let's do this same experiment over here. Got my Photon 2. I'm going to bring that over here. I'm going to do the same thing. I'll create my data frame, create my people table, and run that same query. So that's not going to run using Photon. Now, I'm not expecting a huge difference here, honestly, because the majority of this query is going to be reading data from disk. And then there'll be a little bit of acceleration when it's managing to get some of happening in the Photon Engine. But this data set isn't really big enough to see the kind of bonuses that we'd expect. We're not going to see the real, real speed boost until we're talking about hundreds of million rows and we're doing some fairly crunchy aggregation on it. So be aware it's not absolutely everything that will suddenly go faster as a result of this. I'm just trying to hit some of the things that we know is going to go that little bit faster. Uh, the other thing we can do over in here, so if I go back to this and I want to have a look at that, we should actually see this go a lot faster on the second run because, again, we've got Delta Cache. So the big chunk of this query that is going off and reading data, pulling it back in, is now gone because it can go to its local um, SD. So there we go. Eight seconds in the second run, 20-odd seconds in the first run. So my first query on my Photon took 22 seconds. My first query not with Photon took 37 seconds. Pretty good. It's a nice speed increase. We're seeing it go faster. If we open this up and have a look what happened in here, you can see the associated SQL query, and it's a sea of blue. It's using the traditional normal Spark engine running inside JVMs. It's all actually using the, the thing, the open source, the traditional Spark engine. We can see the steps it goes through. Actually, you can see when we're in the Photon side of things, we go back to that um, query. 
We can then do comparisons between the optimizer. We can see what the different steps it's doing. Actually, the custom shuffle reader is doing is changing the type of join. There's a shuffled hash join, a sort merge join. So actually how it's building that execution plan is different because it's using the more advanced Photon Engine behind the scenes. So it's a good thing to do. If you're thinking, is Photon actually going to help? What you can do is just spin up a cluster now. Change, like make a carbon copy of your existing cluster. Turn Photon on. Run your existing workloads against it. And have a look and see if it's actually using Photon. See if it's, if the kind of queries you're running are using and getting the benefit of that Photon Execution Engine. Because if it's not, it's not worth turning it on. It's going to cost you more and it's not going to do anything. You need to make sure the workload you're putting through it is actually performing using that Photon Engine. <sighs> okay, rant over. Good. Um, one thing to then note is, yeah, still not everything is supported. So there's a note on limitations. We'll go back to in a second. But for example, if I do something real dirty and I go, for each of those years, I want you to do that count. I also want you to bring me back the distinct set of every name, the first name of people who happen to be born in that year. And that's a horrible string aggregation. String aggregations aren't yet in the photon vectorization engine. So that's not going to benefit from it. So it'll do a load of work and the joins and things will still be going photon styly. And then it'll have to do a load of extra stuff. So certain things will force it to fall out of photon and rely, revert back on the normal Spark engine. We'll leave that going for a sec. So what are the main advantages? What are the things that we should be looking for? So one, it's really good in, it can now do data frames and SQL. It was previously SQL only in Databricks SQL and it's Delta and Parquet. I mean, the flip side of that is it's only Delta and Parquet. So if you've got a load of jobs that are reading CSV files, they're reading JSON, that is doing for stuff that, that can't run on Photon yet. So that's a big old limitation, right? Um, so be a little bit careful with it. Uh, for things to be working properly in the Photon Engine, it has to be using Delta or Parquet. So if you've got a load of Parquet data coming in and you want to get that into Delta tables and do a load of aggregation, you want to make some curated assets, perfect. It's going to work perfectly for you. Or maybe you've got an initial job which is running to get data loaded into Delta and that shouldn't run on Photon. And then the next stage is to make some curated assets and to further enrich and refine that data that will run on Photon. Kind of up to you. So to expect to accelerate things, I have a significant amount of data. Another thing, it's economies of scale, this engine. So if you've got a few gig of data, you're not going to see a massive benefit, certainly not for the uplift of price that you'll get with Photon. So generally chunky data sets, big tables joining to big tables, hundreds of millions of rows. Great. We're going to see some real performance benefits. Um, yeah, things go faster when you, you access repeatedly from the Delta cache, use Delta cache. Generally, use Delta Cache enabled uh, VMs and things will go faster. Especially if you're doing things that require repeated reach. You have to go back to that same table several times. It's going to go faster with Delta Caching. Um, scan performance is better with many columns and small files. The wider tables are actually fairly optimized. So big, chunky, the ones that are hard to deal with, actually very good to use Photon with. Um, this is interesting. So I've not tried out these bits saying actually our updates, deletes, merge into's, inserts and create tables and select with Delta are also optimized. So generally my experience of Photon has all been querying because it's been in Databricks SQL. I've been taking existing data sets and just merging it and producing some results. So I really want to try the merge into and say, well, actually the big chunky engineering stuff when I'm getting a load of data and I need to merge it into an existing huge Delta table, how, how much faster does that go? So it's going to be super interesting to see how that works. And again, especially optimized for wide tables. And again, we see things like it replaces sort merge joins with hash joins. Generally, it is faster at doing a lot of that stuff and it'll make better execution plans. So if your workloads fall into those categories, then try it out. It's a good one to actually say, hey, we might be able to reduce our costs by shortening the ETL window and shutting down the cluster sooner or using fewer VMs to achieve the same speed. Or even maybe it's not about cost. Maybe you don't care about cost and you just want things to just go faster, be done quicker. Then it's a good option to turn on. So the limitations that we got, so Delta and Parquet only, no other data sources are currently supported. Um, it doesn't support Windows and sort operations. So if you're using a window function, it's not going to be happy. So technically that uh, collect set, that kind of aggregation function I was doing, that's not supported. Uh, so if we go back over here, so we see it ran, it's happy to do it. 
took 2.8 minutes, not the fastest thing in the world. Uh, but when we go and have a look at what happened inside of that query, we'll see why it went so slow. So it did a load of stuff, and then it pushed it out of the engine. So essentially, it's, it can do that. It can get out so far and then go, oh, I don't know how to do the next bit, and then dump it back. So essentially, there's an interrupt. There's a transfer from the C++ engine into the Java-based engine in traditional Spark. And again, the more it has to do that, the slower things are going to go. So hopefully, it's just a one-off. Shift it over once, get it over with. Because it's had to do that. It's had to move it back, project it from Photon back into traditional Spark to do that. So be a little bit careful. The things that you're doing need to be supported. Uh, I can't do structure stream, which is kind of, it's, it's a bit of a shame because a lot of the way we do engineering these days is through things like autoloader, through things like delta streaming, through using trigger once to stream things, but only do it once and take advantage of checkpointing things. We can't use techniques like that with Photon. You can't use UDFs, even the new SQL UDFs. Uh, and yeah, if it's gonna, if it's a tiny little query, if it's a couple of seconds query, that's not when you're going to see the benefits of Photon. You're going to see the benefits of Photon for big, chunkier queries. So be aware of all that stuff. Again, features not supported by Photon. You're not going to get an error. It's just not going to use Photon. Um, so be very, very aware. If you flick that switch for Photon, and then your price goes up because you're paying slightly more for that DBU, that Databricks, uh, Databricks licensing unit, but the speed doesn't go up because you're using some of the limitations. You're falling out of what is supported by Photon. Therefore, you're not getting the speed boost. Therefore, you're not going to be able to either balance out the speed savings or get the bang fee book. So really, really interesting to see it there. Uh, super keen to just try it out for more traditional data engineering. Absolutely. So you should give it a go and go have a play with that little photon button. Just be wary of your cost and just make sure the things that you're doing, what's targeted for photon. That way you make sure that, again, you're getting the benefit that you're paying for. But yeah, super interesting. Loads we can do with it. Certainly lots of the curated side of life I'm looking at. So getting data in from various sources using things like Autoloader, doing data quality cleaning and that kind of stuff. Don't know if I'll be using Photon for a huge amount of that, given some of those limitations around streaming and all that kind of stuff. But the kind of things where several times a day or even once a day, we're saying, well, re-aggregate that. Make some curated assets for me. In Databricks parlance, if you were saying our bronze and silver tables, probably maybe not using it, but making our gold tables and doing the engineering and building out of these vast array of curated assets using business logic, aggregations, using calculations in there, Maybe that's going to see a massive performance increase if we flick Photon on, and then we just have different clusters. Turn on my normal engineering cluster to get stuff in and stream stuff through. Turn on my Photon cluster to do the real value-adding analytics-y kind of stuff. So, super interesting. Go and have a play. Let me know how you go with it, and if you manage to do that same reduction in terms of VM size and cost. But otherwise, yeah, it's really cool. Go have a play. Look out for those yellow boxes and see how it goes. As always, thank you for joining me, and... Don't forget to like and subscribe. Let me know down in the comments how you get on. And yeah, good luck in your photon journey. Cheers.